<laughs> okay, perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I cannot see my video, but uh, I hope I appear normally. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. There. Okay, good. Let me know if there are if there are any uh, strange things happening uh, during the talk. All right, but thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about SASFU. Uh, and apart from this data analysis part, which is central for SASFU, I also want to talk a bit about what SASFU can do for you and what you can do for SASFU. As uh, you will learn, the SASFU is a community-driven project, so both actually input and output, I should say, is uh, equally important. And so, uh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, um, speaking about SAS, it's of course uh, important to also mention the techniques that it's, uh, that it's primarily been analyzing data from. So, I actually uh, plan to cover quite a few topics today and uh, I learned that's been particularly challenging for this uh, uh, presentation is to find the right background. Uh, so, I arbitrarily choose some material uh, that hopefully will cover the, the the background of the of the audience as well, uh, and I did it based on the uh, watching on the previous uh, webinars. So of course, audience may change this time, but I hope uh, that will provide you enough background to understand what Sashi is doing. Uh, uh, but I know by no means I will ma will be managed to cover everything. So I'm going to talk about the SACS, which is small uh, angle X-ray scattering. Uh, Suns, small angle neutron scattering, and uh, uh, I will also mention a few concepts uh, from data analysis. So uh, let's move on. So, SAS view, uh, so small angle scattering is the technique that is using uh, either X-ray or neutrons uh, beam to investigate the sample, and the part of the beam is transited transited to the sample without any scattering, and the part of it is scattered. And when we have the detector long enough, we can um, then observe the, the scattering pattern on the, on the, on the detector image. Uh, and that's usually measured in terms of the intensity in the function of the Q, uh, which is the scattering vector, which is defined as the difference between the uh, wave vector of the incident beam uh, um, uh, and, the, uh, and the scattered beam. And using small angle scattering, we can usually, usually investigate the structure at the length uh, scales from uh, 1 to 100 nanometers, roughly. Uh, and because of this, uh, we can uh, learn particular information about the system. So we can learn something about the size of the particle, about the shape of the particle, as well as uh, interparticle interactions. We cannot really uh, get uh, direct information about the atomic composition. Uh, that would be to some extent covered by the, by the next speaker, Andrew Sazanov, uh, talking next week when he will talk about the diffraction. Uh, nevertheless, we can still gain quite a lot of information about the sample. Uh, and in um, some particular cases, uh, we can, when we have the sample, which we call that they are oriented, oriented uh, with the respect to the incident beam, we can also learn uh, in get information about the, about the particular orientation. And we also can study magnetic properties uh, of the sample. That's uh, what can be done using small angle neutron scattering. And uh, the spectrum of the samples that can be studied using either SACS or SANS is really, really fast. So essentially, it's only imagination that limits the, what can be studied using SACS or SANS. So here is the list uh, ordered alphabetically. Hopefully, you can find something for yourself. I hope your system is covered here. If not, most likely, it can be studied by uh, SACS or SANS. It's just only that I didn't put this on the list, or someone else that, that I adopted this slide from, actually. Uh, so uh, how sax and sans are related? So the basic physics or the fundamental physics of sax and sans don't really differ, but the properties differ really a great deal. So uh, when we um, think of x-rays, they can be they are essentially readily available and you can use the lab sources 
to uh, to investigate their structure using SACS. And as for example, it's shown here this uh, Nanopix uh, device from the Rigaku. That's essentially, the, as you can see, a uh, small device that allows you for the studying uh, nanoparticles using SACS. We can also go to the synchrotrons and uh, then we have a much uh, higher fluxes that allows for the for the more uh, more intense uh, studies as well as the time resolution is improved uh, which allows for the sub milliseconds time result studies uh, sample size that's uh, there, there were uh, in the previous uh, webinars there were questions about this that's uh, uh, for the for the x-rays that's uh, essentially something bigger than 2.5 microliters depending also on the setup and the instrument uh, and that's considerably smaller than uh, than for neutrons uh, and speaking of neutrons um, and then we, we have to go to the large-scale facilities to perform neutron experiments so here is the picture of Loki which is the science instrument uh, that it's currently under construction at the ESS uh, that will be uh, for the for the science measurements uh, and um, and essentially as you can see the that's uh, that's something probably that would fit hundred of these nanopix uh, devices inside this uh, this cabin um, and uh, we of course have to go to the to the sources like spallation sources as ESS would be or reactor as for example ILL um, is at the moment. The one advantage of the uh, of the using neutrons is that they don't uh, cause radiation damage to the samples. Also provide to study time, uh, uh, perform studies in the time resolution. However, that's not exactly the same scale as for the X-rays. The sample required though is much larger. So uh, we are talking here about the hundred of microliters rather than uh, tens. Uh, on the other hand, it also provides the, the something which is called contrast variation, which is the, um, and the, the property of the neutrons that allows for the, uh, for the studying part of the complex. For example, if we have a protein and a protein nucleic acid complex, we can match out the nucleic acid and observe only protein or vice versa, match out protein contribution and observe only nucleic acid. And, uh, New, new, uh, neutrons also uh, have spin, so as uh, have nuclei, so when the neutrons uh, interact with the nuclei, they give the magnetic moment and uh, by this uh, it's able to, um, and it's possible to study, uh, study magnetic properties uh, in solids, uh, both uh, static and dynamic. So neutron experiments usually have a higher entry barrier, so to say. You have to sort of make a more justification for the for the studying them, but it doesn't mean that it's not worth performing these experiments. And uh, as I said, there are some uh, experiments like contrast variation and magnetics that essentially can only be done using neutrons. But in general, these techniques are complementary. And speaking of the entry barrier, we hope that ESS will lower this and will allow more. Uh, studies uh, using neutrons. So what kind of information do we get? Uh, in the majority of cases when we don't have uh, magnetism or oriented systems, we usually get uh, this 1D curve. So the detector image that I showed on the first slide can be usually averaged to this 1D, 1D scattering pattern that corresponds to the intensity defined uh, in the function of the vec of this uh, scattering vector q. Uh, however, if we go for this oriented or magnetic system, then we have something uh, that refers to the 2D images, and that's kind of data that we get. So if we now think of what actually is being covered by this data, so this is the, the protein system that I have been working with at some point it's called modulin which is the uh, protein um, consisting of the two domains connected by the flexible linker and uh, we uh, established that there are some confirmations that can be captured uh, that the small angle scattering data corresponds to but 
now if you think of the how much degrees of freedom or how or how many parameters you need to describe the systems both atoms and this movement is actually quite a lot and here we have just a one single curve that corresponds to the system so it is inevitable that we have a considerable loss of structural information by going from the from the sample to the curve that we usually have from the small angle scattering and therefore it's extremely important to actually define your model correctly also using knowledge from the from the other technique or physical principles or whatever else we know about the sample as well as the risk to overfitting to data is quite high excuse me so for those of you who watched the the webinar last week maybe you recall that thomas presented something like typical data analysis workflow so that's essentially something that we would routinely do for the for the analyzing small angle scattering data uh, and uh, it uh, works uh, or it's uh, the fundamentals for this are that we acquire the data and then we assume that we uh, get this um, i of q curve or 2d image uh, and then what we need to do we need to define model with uh, the three uh, parameters uh, and uh, and then calculate the scattering pattern for it and uh, uh, match it with the data so uh, i will briefly go through these steps now so the what i mean by the defining the model so the uh, this is the pr probably the simplest uh, um, equation that one can come up with in terms of the describing the uh, i of q relationship with the structural properties uh, of the models or the, the, the or coupling the models with the intensity so it essentially uh, represents intensity in terms of the density of the particles concentration something which is called form factor that corresponds to the particle shape uh, and structure factor which corresponds to the particle interactions and these form factors can be defined differently it can for example be calculated from the directly from the protein structure coordinates as it's shown here in this example of dimer or it can be calculated for the analytical model like for example the cylinder of the radius of 40 angstroms and the length of 200 angstroms on the other hand the the uh, structure factor that um, that is defined differently and we have a different model so to say so for example here we we look at something which is called hard sphere and that's the uh, the model that corresponds to the uh, ex exclusive volume repulsive interactions of the molecules and the one thing to note here is that in these two cases above we have a maximum and the, this region which we call low q region and here is actually opposite so couple this together uh, if we have the if we have the for example repulsive interaction then we see the effect of this uh, on our i of q curve um, so so this is uh, particularly important when you study the, the the concentrated samples but in many cases for example in the in the bio sector sense people tend to dilute uh, systems enough so s of q can be estimated to actually uh, be close to one so once we define this model we can perform the fitting so we let's assume that we have a data shown here and as a blue dots and then we define the model the cylindrical model uh, that is in this case of the length as it's shown here uh, and then for this initial step we can calculate the property which is called chi-square which reflects the uh, discrepancy between the uh, points that we get from the experimental data and the um, and the points calculated from the model and this is divided by the error so this property is usually used for the optimization we are 
uh, in this sense that we are minimizing this value in order to get fit. And once this is done, we can get the refined parameters. And as it's shown here, this data will correspond to the cylinder model of the 440 uh, radius. And as you can see, the drop in the chi-square is considerable. One thing to note here, and if you recall what I said a few slides back, I mean, the risk of er to overfitting is high. So one has to be careful in terms of just using the chi-square optimization, especially in the system that involve a lot of degrees of freedom. So let's uh, go back to the slides that I showed before. And we'll now segue to SASView because SASView, it actually covers all these three points from the model definition to fitting and producing the results and nice plots and whatsoever. So very briefly about the SASFIO. SASFIO originates from the uh, National Science Foundation founded project called DANCE that was initiated in 2006. And it continued like this for a few years. And then in uh, 2013, it was turned into a community driven project. It's currently supported by nine facilities, both X-ray and neutrons. We have about uh, 40 contributors, maybe even more. Um, uh, about 15 are active at any one time. Uh, and we have a steering body consisting of uh, Paul Butler from NIST, Mathieu Dusset, Oronel, Andrew Jackson, ESS, and Steve King, ISIS. And the more co most coordination of the project is actually done through the bi-weekly calls when we talk together and decide what we do and what we not do uh, and have fun as well during these calls. So that's, uh, that's really lively collaboration and a nice, nicely going project. And we also have a regular camps and other events that I will uh, mention later on. And most importantly, some of the SASV members are on this call. So I'm at least aware of the Paul Butler, Steve King and Nicola Martinez that uh, said that they will join, us, uh, join this call and uh, they can also participate in the discussion if, uh, um, if I need basically a backup on some questions. Uh, because that's the, really one of the strengths of the SAS field, that we're coming from the different fields of the expertise uh, and, um, and we work together in this interdisciplinary uh, environment and I hope we are producing a good piece of software. So this is how, how does it look when it comes to background? Uh, and that's how actually our day-to-day -day work looks like. So um, I think that there is a been typical understanding of the, of this as we as being a primarily coding project, but I would say coding is just a part of it. I mean, the, the results of the part that involves uh, working on the theory uh, all uh, stuff regarding the uh, maintaining the infrastructure, project management, doc documentation and tutorials are actually equally uh, important as all the other parts uh, and education and outreach is uh, also uh, important task that we try to perform. So coding is not only part of the SASB project. So now let's dive into, into the SAS field. Uh, so this is how SASV looks like when uh, you open it, at least on the Mac OS X. Uh, and then you can see that you have some load button and send to the feeding. Uh, and I will go through some of these functionalities now. So this is how the typical feeding looks like. So as you see, it's become a little bit more easy. So I will, go through, uh, I will try to go step by step through these different functionalities. So first of all, we can load the data and we have a data management table that allows for the loading common data formats, including uh, NX Kansas formats as well. Um, and then we can, uh, what we call, send uh, our data to the different analysis. So one can choose between fitting, uh, P of R inversion, correlation functions and invariant calculation. Uh, one can also manipulate plotting uh, to some extent in this uh, in this field, um, and then um, speaking of these models, I mean the the model definition. So what I what I presented before was, for example, the cylindrical model, cylinder model, 
which is one of the 70 models uh, of the form factors, or even more than 70 models of the form factors that we support um, in the in the SAS field. So they can be choose uh, from this different menu from the categories and model name. As and the same is true for the structure factor, which can be coupled with the with the form factor. Uh, then we can uh, define something which is called polydispersity. So in the real life, we usually don't have um, uh, samples or the particles in the sample that look exactly the same, but they may differ slightly in the overall shape. And therefore, we, we may want to introduce the polydispersity to the data, and SAS also allows for this. The same is with the resolution smearing. Uh, that's uh, more uh, related to the to the fact the how the experiment was performed and the instrumental setup. And uh, um, um, SASIA provides the uh, two ways of actually defining it, either manually or automatically from the, uh, from the file, if this is, of course, written into the file. And when it comes to the feeding modes, we can actually perform uh, either single uh, feeding with the, just the one curve, as it's shown here, but we can also do the, uh, do the batch feeding, which means that uh, we can apply the same uh, feeding of the same model to the multiple data sets, as well as we can um, uh, perform simultaneous feeding, which is the feeding that involves using the common parameters across um, different models for the, uh, for the, for the multiple data sets. And I also mentioned that uh, we can perform this 2D analysis and in a SAS with the formulation from, for, for this is done through the something which is called orientation or polydispersity. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been set up in a way that it decouples the frame of the, the orientation from the, from the form factor, so to say, uh, and the and therefore it can be also performed uh, uh, efficiently. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this, uh, these computations are quite uh, computationally intense and therefore uh, we particular for these models, but not only for this, but also for others, enable computation on the graphical processor units, these graphic cards, and that allow for the fast execution of the uh, fitting. The other feature of SASFU is that it can use something which is uh, um, called CSANS data, which is spin equal small angle neutron scattering. And that's a very interesting technique that's using polarized neutrons to actually extend the sort of the, this limit of the, of the landscape that can be probed by, uh, by SANS. So here we are talking about the range from the 20 nanometers to 20 micrometers. Uh, and SASFU set it up in the way, uh, in SASFU it's set up in the way that it can actually use the full potential of the form factors uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we have readily available. And there is a trick, uh, mathematical trick called Hankel transform that allows transformation of these models into the CSANS data. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not going very much into the details about this technique, but if you're interested, then uh, I, would, uh, I would refer to the uh, papers of the Dean Bauman, um, who've been uh, also contributing to, to, to SASFU on this project. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the sort of core of the optimization is, um, uh, is driving the way that the, that the fitting is performed in SAS. So it's very important functionality. And actually uh, for SAS, we benefit a lot from the project called BAMS, uh, which is uh, developed by Paul Kinzel from NIST. Uh, and it allows both conventional and Bayesian optimization, uh, which uh, provides um, uncertainty estimation of the inferred parameters. And that's uh, very important in, in terms of the uh, small angle scattering because um, you actually, as I, as I pointed out, the, 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 the loss of information, it's, it's considerable and therefore we usually have the 
quite considerable error bars. And therefore, we also want to know how this uncertainty is reflected on our fit. So BAMPS allows uh, this kind of analysis as they are shown here at the different plots and uh, the trajectories as well as uncertainties, as well as provides uh, quite some uh, choice of the, of the optimizers. One other nice feature of uh, SAS field that I think it's uh, particularly useful for the, for the community is the fact that it allows for the easy addition of the plugin models. So if you have the system that you cannot really choose this, any analytical model from the 70 plus models that we have in the SAS field, then you can uh, write your own. And uh, that's actually, this task can actually be done in both ways. So one can start writing up directly from the Python and then looking at the, usually looking at how other models are structured. But we also provide the tool, the, the model editor, and that allows in a few simple steps to generate the Python code that can be then used in SASFI. And that's actually directly available in SASFI and you can use it straight off once you click apply button on this model editor. Uh, if you then have uh, some complicated model and that actually uh, requires uh, more uh, speed optimization than uh, the, usually the recommended way is to go uh, for the for the C implementation that is also nicely interfaced to to Python uh, that we uh, support. So it's um, it's actually can uh, the so size we can uh, support two types of model and model uh, files uh, and um, and performance. Um, optimization on the GPU is then also ready available. The, uh, the, the feature of the models that uh, at least from the, uh, from the SAS view uh, models that we support, we, we provide is that we, uh, that we always have a full description of what's happening in the, in the model. So it's easy to keep track on what exactly the map is that we'd like to perform. And we also test our models. So we uh, check in the, every time we uh, add a new feature to the code that actually the model gives the same answer as we would expect. Okay, so I've been now discussing mostly things that, uh, that assume that we know the model, but that's not essentially not always the case. Sometimes we, especially at the initial stage of the analysis want to uh, want to learn something directly from the data. And this can be done through, uh, for example, calculation of this power dot scattering invariant, uh, which uh, is essentially integral that it's uh, proportional to the fluctuation of the scattering length density and the phase composition. And what it actually provides, it provides the independent estimate of the volume fraction that then can be used to, to understand porosity of the material uh, and the surface area, which can, for example, corresponds to reactivity. It can also be used as a sanity check if you want to sort of see if the, if the say, sample gives the same answer of the different instruments. The other um, possibility is to use the P of R and uh, per distance distribution inversion. Uh, and this is probability of finding a vector of length R uh, between scattering centers. Uh, and in SASPI, we use uh, this P of R formula, which is uh, uh, using Moore's derivation. derivation. And what P of R provides, it can provide the information of the, of the maximum dimension of the, of the molecule. But as you can see here, I mean, depending on the shape of the particle, uh, we also get the considerably different uh, P of R functions. And therefore we can learn something about the, our system even without introducing the model. So this can be done directly from the data. We can calculate this property using Fourier transform 
our inverse Fourier transform um, from scattering data. And in SATSU, this can be done uh, also through, uh, through this, what we call this perspective. Uh, and the, uh, and this, uh, there is, a, apart from the, from, the, from the fit, P of R fit that we can generate, uh, we can also uh, use the exploratory tool, which shows us where this uh, Dmax should be sort of defined, because there are some parameters that one can have to set up in this analysis, and SASV is providing some nice uh, features to, to explore these uh, values. The uh, last... Uh, sort of core functionality, as I would say, uh, in SASV is something uh, that is particularly useful for the material science, and that's the correlation functions that can be uh, interpreted as an imaginary rod moving through the structure of the material. Uh, and SASV provides the different um, correlation functions, one and three-dimensional correlation functions that can uh, give us information about the uh, periodicity or, uh, for example, if uh, material is amorphous. So, so far I've been uh, discussing this analysis or the perspective um, uh, functionality of SASFU. However, that's uh, not all. Actually, the, the, the number of tools or the features actually uh, uh, much larger, uh, and just to mention a few, we have uh, tools for the scattering land density calculator, slit size cal cal calculator, generic scattering calculator, for example, to calculate the uh, the scattering pattern from the uh, from the protein coordinates, uh, and um, and also a few other utility tools. Uh, so I'm not, for the interest of time, I'm not going to get into these details, but if you are interested, please uh, check either in SASFIELD or uh, other resources. So very briefly about the SASFIELD architecture, how is its structure and what one can do. So the part that I was talking about that was the sort of outer layer of SASFIELD, which is this graphical user interface, and that's uh, what we as a, as the users can manipulate with the with the program without uh, touching any code. However, uh, these days it's becoming more and more increasingly popular to use the Jupyter notebooks uh, and other scripts to to run the software. And actually, SASFI also provides the means to to do uh, to use this kind of interface. So. We have uh, something which is called SASCALC, which is the, essentially the backend calculator for the, for, the, for the graphical user interface. We have this package which is called SAS models, which is defining both form and structure factors. And we have this thing called BAMPS, which is the optimizer. Uh, and uh, because of this, we can, uh, uh, as I said, run SASV from the script. So here is the example of the feeding using uh, SAS models and pumps. So not uh, really touching the, the, the outer layer at all. Uh, and uh, once this is done, one can uh, detach the, 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 or the deploy the script on the, on the computer class and wrap it up, run it over there. The other possibility that we also been working on, I mean, though it's uh, still a little bit experimental is to define all your parameters inside the SAS view and your fit, save this state, detach from the GUI, and then run this sort of project file on the uh, on the cluster. So that's also the neat functionality that doesn't require any knowledge of the scripting. However, uh, it opens up for these possibilities of using computer cluster if you have a long analysis. This uh, is just to illustrate the another example using the scripting interface. So we can also use this for the for the per distance distributions calculations as well as we can just uh, use the SAS models directly 
to generate uh, our favorite form factor or whatever. So uh, this is uh, this is essentially covering most of the of the SAS view uh, in terms of the functionality. What I would like to briefly uh, talk about is how to use uh, SAS view and what resources are uh, provided. So this is uh, typically the uh, how you start using it. You go to the to the SAS view website and then you choose the uh, choose the downloadable version and then you start interacting with this. As you probably notice, I mean, we currently support version four and version five. Uh, version five recently has been getting more and more attention. So there are more frequent release. Um, and that's something that we'll eventually move on, but uh, there are still user that, uh, users that prefer to use version four. So we still support it. Uh, if you don't like GUI at all, no matter if four or five, then uh, you are of course very welcome to clone the uh, repository on Git and interact directly with the code. Code is uh, written mostly in Python, plus some C part that is used for the for the GPU optimization. Um, but you are also welcome to do so. And so uh, I mentioned that the five version is being. Uh, uh, released more often, oftenly these days, uh, and we mostly been releasing the the, uh, the point releases. Uh, there will be uh, by point me release. I mean the 502. There is actually 503 coming up uh, soon as well. Uh, that we've been uh, fixing many bugs, but also providing uh, new features and improvements, mostly driven by the user requests. So if you want to get some feature done, then I think that uh, the best uh, um, and uh, some feature done sooner than later, then, then uh, you're of course welcome to, to talk about this and or report it through the different means that I will just discuss on the next slide. Uh, and for the sort of bigger picture, we have uh, something, uh, we have a SASP roadmap, which is the living document that we keep uh, in the five year span uh, that defines uh, more uh, top level goals for SASP. Uh, and here are examples of the, uh, of the, what we've been planning for the, for this coming year, essentially. So as I said, we, uh, we plan to release a bigger uh, version and uh, uh, and complete some some other milestones. So if you are interested, uh, then please take a look on the on this link below. Uh, however, if you, uh, as I said, encounter uh, some issue and you want to share it with the community, you of course are welcome to email us. Uh, but also. Uh, we store everything on the GitHub, so there are no secrets. Everyone can see what we currently been working on. So day-to-day -day issues uh, are stored on GitHub and are available. So if you're interested in this, then please take a look on this. Uh, I would also would like to mention what SASV cannot do, and um, one has to be fair about it. So we are not saving the word here. Uh, um, so we don't do molecular modeling and as well as ab initio modeling. So there, I just mentioning two uh, software packages here. So SASI that's been doing uh, molecular dynamics and combining this with uh, small angle scattering. So if you are interested in this kind of studies, then I would refer to uh, to to these approaches. And if especially if you are coming from the bio SACS or SANS community, you most likely encounter a software called ADSAS, which is really a comprehensive toolbox that is also providing many other functionalities like this ab initio reconstructions that I would uh, advise to use with caution, uh, but uh, that's, that's not really functionality that we, that we cover with SAS view. So as the other rigid body modeling, um, using the protein models. 
uh, that's uh, to some extent true <laughs> with this uh, with this molecular modeling because I also uh, I will now demonstrate on the example that I worked um, and that now uh, with this with this possibility of using Sasu from script we can actually achieve many of this functionality as well so this is the uh, example of the virus capsid assembly so the 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 project that i've been working on at the lund university uh, and uh, the basic idea of this project is that we have a self-assembling virus capsid so these are the proteins that um, assemble to the to the final product this ball called capsid and typically what we don't know is what happens in between. And if you think in terms of the number of combinations that you can have, as so for example, this uh, capsid consists of 240 subunits, then you have a really humongous number of the combinations that you can go to one state from this, from this uh, start state to the end state. Uh, and we combine molecular modelings with this, um, with the, uh, small angle x-ray scattering and uh, uh, collected the data at the ESRF um, last year uh, that was done in a collaboration with my colleagues from the different institutions and uh, for the trained eyes you can see that uh, for the for the later time point uh, for the trained small angle scattering eyes I should say uh, you can see that you have a caution like structure um, coming up at the later stage. So long story short, we established that uh, the, this assembly pathway proceeds through the uh, essentially two intermediates. So we have a dimer uh, state at the beginning, then we have a hexamer. They are not exactly on the same scale, uh, but uh, then we have the, uh, then we have the, um, intermediate that corresponds to the 80 subunits and then at the end we have a mixture of the uh, different capsids and then using the some clever mathematics we established that um, that we have a uh, we can infer the population weights uh, along this time uh, that's an uh, exciting study, but uh, the, the, mostly the reason why I brought it up is that at the beginning of the studies we didn't really uh, know what is the exact composition of the of the end state and uh, we've been uh, getting information from the electron microscopy uh, that it's uh, that there are it's mostly dominated by this um, bigger capsid that uh, consists of the 240 subunits uh, and what I did I combined uh, this atomistic model together with the SASV analytical model in order to learn what uh, what are the fractions what are parameters of the uh, potentially the other models and based on this we established that we can actually uh, or that we have the mixture of the uh, of the different um, capsid which is smaller than the uh, than the one that uh, we are getting uh, electron microscopy data from so that uh, helped out uh, with the initial uh, analysis uh, to to establish this fact that it's uh, consists in this data. So just very briefly finishing off because I'm running out of uh, time. Uh, we provide a lot of resources for the education and outreach. Uh, so um, we uh, have a, of course, website documentation, different tutorials. Uh, we've been uh, teaching uh, different schools and giving different courses. Uh, we also have an e-learning platform, uh, uh, so uh, the, differently, uh, we, the SASFI course is also uh, ported on the, uh, it's available from the eneutrons.org, which is e-learning platform, and we also have some other communication channels, uh, so please uh, check them if you're interested uh, in them. The two uh, aspects that I want to mention are the one is the marketplace, uh, which is available at this URL. And that's uh, actually very nice um, um, venue for the, 
for the community contributor model. So if you develop the model that you want to share with the rest uh, of the SASV community, then you can upload it over there and that would be uh, available and one can use it for the uh, together with SASV in the different uh, in the different aspects. Um, and that was actually work done by the uh, uh, ISIS summer students to read Archkrill, who, who did an excellent job on setting this up. And that's really a nice tool for the community. Uh, and I mentioned this uh, code camps or selfie camps and other events. So we are planning to provide more training. So we have a sort of long standing goal for this, but we want to have a, have a boot camp which would provide the training from the basic use to becoming essentially a core developer. One can stop at any, any, any uh, stage one wants. Uh, we also, uh, and if you're interested, then uh, there is a link to syllabus here, what we're planning to do. There is no that said for this, but uh, we will announce for this as also for the other events, all the relevant information in these different channels. Uh, and we also recently been having hackathons because we have to move our uh, regular events to the uh, to the virtual events. But I think it's been working uh, quite fine actually. Uh, and we um, and we are still hoping to have a code camp ten at some point soon. That was planned originally for the April this year, but it was cancelled for the obvious reason. Uh, and then most likely will be held at Caltech. Um, at some point, but as I said, I mean, please follow this uh, and this communication channels if you are interested. So, lastly, I just want to say that uh, you are very welcome to come and work with us. We have a lot of fun together. We uh, don't only do the coding, theory, cracking, and the uh, math calculation. We also enjoy a simple pleasure of life and uh, like eating and stuff. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions now. Thank you very much, Wojtek. It was a really interesting talk. So we have several questions for you. Hope you're ready. Uh, so we start uh, with uh, a short question from one of the um, attendants. So, uh, does the form factor also include the size? That's a very short and general question. <laughs> uh, let me open the chat. Uh, uh, I want, okay. I will also just try to be. Uh, so it's like, so do I understand that the form factor also includes size? That's uh, the question. Uh, right. So, okay. Uh, so I, I was trying to just also follow this. So sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, no, it's not the difficult question. Um, so yes, in this sense that you, uh, when you define the, the form factor, then you account for the, for the size, uh, size and shape of the particle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we continue with other questions. So can we calculate the pore size and shape uh, of a porous material or only it can be measured for single crystal using stacks? Uh, so both stacks and science can be applied to the porous materials. So okay. uh, that's not, uh, uh, that's definitely uh, possible. Yes. Okay. Okay. The next question is, SASView could find application in organic thin films applications. Can you repeat, please? I mean, there is something with the noise. There, therefore, I've been uh, trying to find the. Yeah, chapter. it could be our yeah our microphone. So, SASView could find application in inorganic thin films. Inorganic films. Inorganic thin films applications. Well, I mean, uh, Thank you <laughs> I, I personally don't have any experience with these systems, and I couldn't recall any any paper doing this, but uh, maybe my SASU colleagues can comment on this. Uh, Paul, Steve, Nicola. Uh, we you can unmute them if we find them. If, so Paul if the, is with us today, Paul Butler. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
if they, if they want, of course, other than that, I would say that it's most likely yes, but I, I just don't, don't know. So let's, let's uh, welcome Paul yeah, here. Uh huh. <laughs> he may still on the uh, audio. audio. Oops. Oh, it might not be. Mm -hmm. Okay, we keep. Okay, Paul. You need to unmute yourself. Good. Yes. Welcome. Hey, hey, hey. So nice to have you with us. <laughs> Hi, Are you in the US? Uh, uh, yes, I am in the US. I did not fly over for this. Okay. <laughs> Uh, really no, uh, the the answer uh i'm trying to think on film films um if you can model it then sas view would be used for it i kind of think of in film applications mostly what i know people do with that would be um uh, usually looking for domains, maybe in thin films, in uh -huh. which case, definitely, you could use uh, models to uh, try to understand perhaps the size of the domains. Um, uh, if you are looking at uh, texture, then you might be using the invariant to look for uh, the interfaces. Uh, so, so, yes, if you can do small angle scattering with it, then you can look at that data with FASTU, essentially. Great. We keep receiving more questions and more detailed questions. <laughs> so it's when, when Paul turned up online, they <laughs> people so, started to get more courage. The person in the audience is asking, I encountered some misbehaving when activating polydispersity. I will try the latest version first to see if bugs are solved. But can you comment which procedure is expected to communicate with the developers when encountering some issues? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for this feedback. Uh, and uh, we are aware of the of the problems with the police dispersity, especially for the for the previous versions uh, of SASView. If you were using uh, SASView five, because I presume that's the that's the one. I think for the SASView four, there shouldn't be. So uh, the uh, and uh, if it hasn't been solved with the 502 version, then hopefully it will be solved with the 503 because we also been addressing uh, polydispersity uh -huh. issues uh, over there. So I would recommend uh, checking out one that will be out soon, hopefully. Uh, but the uh, but the way to interact uh, the 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 most straightforward way is to to, to drop us a line and to write the email uh, and um, the email for this it's uh, it can be found on the website or in this presentation um, and the the other possibility if someone has the github account one can also create an issue directly um, by going to the interface uh, and then writing i discovered this and mm -hmm. that and, and so on and also the the github may help out actually recognizing that if this is common issue and actually we've been already uh, working on this so that that also may give you a hint that uh, okay they already know about this and they are they are working about it for, uh, to to resolve this great can I, so we want to remind add, the audience that they can, add can always uh, send you questions yes can i add one thing for of course text <laughs> answer uh, on the polydispersity question uh we know actually it's not fixed in 5.0.2 completely we know that uh nicola who from ill uh, has been working on that the hackathon and i believe uh having looked at it that it will fix everything that we now know about okay so if you wait for 5.0.3 which should be out in a few weeks i hope uh, if you still find problems, then either send a note to developers at sasview.org or on GitHub. That's great. Yes. 
So yeah, the Arabian technology for the very detailed quest, uh, answer. Uh, we have another question. Does size view provide solutions for size spacing correlation approximation for dense packed particle with certain size distribution or fully dispersed orientation in loosely packed system with unit shaped particles? Wow, it's okay. a long question, I can repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, sounds like very specific, domain specific question. I would yeah. say that probably would require, um, so we can provide what we can provide and we do our best in uh, providing this. We cannot support all the models uh, possible. Uh, so to be honest, I don't know exactly if, if, we, if, we, if we have uh, structure factors to model these interactions. But uh, the other part of answer is that uh, nothing prevents from writing it. Uh, hopefully yeah. if the mathematic formulation is done, then it can, done, can be done through the, through the plugin model system. Yes, exactly, because we want to remind to the audience that they can always find all the speakers information online on the LIPS web page, so they can always contact you, the developers, and then maybe ask and interact with you because you're very kind and so <laughs> available. So we really, yeah, thank you for this availability. We continue with the questions, and those are more general, I would say. So can we use this view for 3D topography? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not that I know, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe in some aspects. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, simply I don't know. Uh, I, I wouldn't say directly, but uh, but there might be some aspect that will be complementary to the other software. Oh. Then there is um, another general question. Any preliminary characterization tool? Uh, before we use SACS or SANS. So because you have been talking about fitting your data with certain parameters, so before going actually to the to the real experiments, mm. what can be done before home? Yes, of course, especially if you measure at the large scale facilities, it's very important that you have a sample that it well behaved and you can perform yes. the measurements uh, and you can come back home with the, uh, with the, with the good uh, quality data. So uh, I personally have experience with the biomolecules. So I mean, the anything that can tell you about the concentrations and the oligomeric state that usually useful, like AUC, for example. I don't really know how about the other materials. What what can be applied? But uh, usually, the uh, if you have a mono dispersed sample, especially for the for the biosystem that that usually helps a lot. Uh, and for this, I would advise for the following the instrument specific documentation. Usually they provide the hints what, uh, what, you, what you should expect or, the, uh, or, the, or what, what are the sort of the checklists that you should do before going there, just not to come out disappointed. I mean, we, we can do our best, but the data has to be good enough. I mean, uh, yeah. you, you, you saw the, <laughs> The, 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 the information lost is, is considerable. So we, we are already working with the difficult problem. So any of other course. factors that it's uh, uh, differing the data, it's of course uh, just making problem more difficult to solve. Yeah, but it's really interesting to see that people can actually be introduced to the software that would be used for the data analysis. And then when you know what are the critical parameters, then focus on them and you know, to get information about that before going. So it's, it's really important, I believe. So. We continue uh, with another, uh, a little bit more specific. So how do we calculate the surface per volume ratio from scattering vector? Um, uh, sounds really... like an invariant <laughs> <laughs> question. Yeah. Maybe Paul can take it because he recently <laughs> been uh, cracking the mat to the, to the death for this. So I think uh, you are the expert on this now. <laughs> but you can maybe keep, keep it general and maybe if oh, people are really interested yes, in the mat, I mean, they can so, always contact you. So, so I think the, the best answer that I can give, I mean, if uh, once the, uh, this 503 version is out, Paul did an excellent job on putting the commentation for this. And uh, everything is very nicely written over there. So I would say that, that for the particular <laughs> equation that I would recommend reading this. 
Um, and the yes, because otherwise I'm not sure how I can go over the, the map simply. But of Paul course, has... there, there, no, the math is complicated. You don't want to look at that. I mean, <laughs> basically, basically, it's very simple. If you're wanting to look at the surface to volume ratio, what you're really looking at is the interfaces. So you want very good data at high Q. That's where you're going to get uh, all the interfaces will show up. So if you know the Porod constant, uh, which you can basically, that's where you get the extrapolation at high Q. So you want good data at high Q uh, and then just plug in those numbers into the invariant calculator and you will get the surface to volume ratio. Oh, very so if you nice want the mathematical answer. details, you can read it more carefully. Very nice answer. Thank you very much, Paul. And we have the last question then. So can we estimate the assembly, uh, assembly state, state, state of macromolecule system in solution? Uh, so uh, the question is using SASVI or the other method? So I mean the, um, uh, yes, and the answer is generally yes. So I mean the, mm -hmm. to, to, to that, that of course it's sometimes tricky because you can have the convoluted signal. So essentially yes. if you have a mixture of the different oligomeric states, then what you see from the scattering that's the mixture of this. So we don't see this for, for particular species. So you have to deconvolute this signal. And uh, um, there are different tools to do this. I mean, the SVD is the singular value decomposition is one tool. Um, there are also the potentially better approach using, for example, MCR analysis, uh, not getting into the details. Uh, but one can also do some other decomposition and I've been developing for this uh, time resolved uh, system, the capsid assembly, I've been developing the Bayesian approach to the decompose the uh, the system. So uh, currently from SASV it's not directly available. Combined together this can be done uh, as, as I demonstrated uh, in the example that I showed. Uh, so in general from data, yes, uh, from SASV not at the moment I would say. Okay, okay. okay, so thank you very much.